in, if that's all right. Sure. All right, here we go. Uh, three, two, one, hitting record. Well, it's my pleasure to have Mr. Rob Moore uh, on the Meaningful Money podcast. Rob described himself as a generalist when I asked him how he wanted to, uh, how he wanted me to introduce him. So, generalist he is. And uh, Rob, you can add more detail in a minute. But first, welcome to Meaningful Money. How are you doing today? Good, thank you, Pete. Uh, thank you for having me. No worries. Where are you uh, based? Uh, Peterborough, in the middle of the country, but also in the middle of nowhere, where um, even people from London an hour away don't know where Peterborough is. No. I'm not sure I could have pinpointed it on a map. Is that like home? Is that where you were raised? Well, I wasn't born there. I was born in Newmarket and I've always been around that sort of East Anglia area, yeah. Okay, all right. Nice part of the world, though. It's uh, sort of deep England, if you like. Mm. So, Rob, give us a shout. Tell us who you are, what it is you do, and really how you got to this point. Okay, so I'll try and give you the radio edit, the short version. (laughs) Um, My dad raised me as an entrepreneur, to be an entrepreneur, because he was an entrepreneur. And he used to have pubs, clubs, bars, hotels, restaurants, you name it. And he was millionaire bust, millionaire bust, crazy journey. Um, mm. And, you know, like he raised in some, me some skills and values, which, you know, I think gave me that desire to be free, to be my own boss, to, you know, manage my own ship. And then I got stuck in the school system. And I'm not knocking the school system, because if you're a doctor, a dentist, a lawyer, the current school system is perfect for that. But if you want to set up your own business, be an entrepreneur, become a, you know, a multimillionaire, um, have an enterprise, disrupt, innovate, create, I think that most of the schooling system and the university system doesn't take you down that path. So I got lost uh, and actually got myself in about £50,000 worth of consumer debt after nice. uni and credit cards and everything else. Like With inflation, that's probably double now with what it was yeah. back then. Uh, and I lost my way. And long story short is I um, had I was an artist trying to express this freedom and the gallery owner who was hanging my work and I wasn't doing so well at art. I was a bit too forward thinking for Pete Peterborough. I should have been in London. Um, <laughs> that's what I say anyway. And he said, hey, look, you should come to this property event. And I was like, what do I know about property? And he's like, well, you go and learn. And he was like, I said, well, don't you need big deposits, loads of money to buy properties? He's like, no, you can do properties, no money down, other people's money, joint ventures, read these books. And he gave me Think and Grow Rich and Rich Dad Poor Dad. And I guess I got to the point where I'd had enough of being skint and I was just maybe a bit desperate. I was probably a couple of months away from going bust. So I thought, you know what, I've not read a book for 10 or 15 years, but what am I going to lose? I read Think and Grow Rich, I was hooked. I read Rich Dad Poor Dad, I was hooked. I went to this property networking event. And the very first time I went to that event, I met my uh, business partner of 11 years, Mark Homer. And um, fast forward to now, we've bought, owned, co-owned together and with partners about 720 properties. Um, I became a millionaire between the ages of 30 and 31. Um, So, you know, it didn't take me that many years after spending seven or eight years in the wilderness. Uh, we uh, built a training business, Progressive Property, which is the UK's largest property training business. Uh, and then once I financially retired, so I, I financially retired a few times, um, got really bored and had to go back. We were t- talking before, weren't we, Pete, about what do you do? Are you busy? And I try not to stay too busy. But if I don't have things to do, I just tend to annoy everybody. Um, so each time I've retired from property or business or whatever, um, I'll go and write, do podcasts. I have my money podcast and the Disruptive Entrepreneur podcast. Yesterday morning, Pete, I finished my 12th book. Um, nice. So I, I write a lot. Uh, and my best selling book is Money. So I guess I'm the most known for helping people make money, manage money, master money. I've got a couple of world records for public speaking. Um, oh. Hey, look, I, I don't want this to be a Rob show. So no, that, um, that is many pies. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. I mean, I. Uh, you're one of these people that you know sort of enters the consciousness usually because i'm you know forever checking my sort of standings in the itunes <laughs> yes an addiction podcast. isn't it <laughs> and uh you know, the same people tend to show up quite frequently and you're one of those mm-hmm. and that's for the disruptive entrepreneurs so tell me a little bit that, about that but also tell me about the the other podcast then and you, you know what your goal is with dishing out all this free content sure okay um so my business partner my wife Uh, the MD of our company and my mum have always said, uh, you can talk. And if you can make a living talking, uh, then, you know, that's going to be a great gift for you. Uh, So I've always been able to articulate, talk a lot. Catharsis and therapy for me is not holding things in, but speaking things because I've got some addictive tendencies. And if I store stuff in, that's not good for my um, sort of mental wellness, if you like. Um, So I just really enjoy 
doing stuff like this. Like I do this for free. I'm good. You know, like it's a pleasure to be on your podcast and have your faith, Pete. And, you know, I just, I couldn't think of a better way to spend an hour. Obviously there's familial things I love to do as well, but I just genuinely enjoy and passionately want to get a message out to the world, um, which is part therapy for me and part to help other people. And what I found is I've, I've been able to figure out a few things in my life that had, had eluded me and failed me. Like I was raised to be an entrepreneur, but I spent many years not believing I could be I suppose mm-hmm. I was raised by a dad who'd made money and then I was poor um, and, and, and then I thought well if I can figure these out for myself then the next stage is to figure these out for others um, and so I expressed that through my podcast The Disruptive Entrepreneur my podcast Money and of course the, the 12 books I've written um, also and you know because it's not just about giving and philanthropy I do like to do that Pete but it's also a good source of revenue in yeah. information marketing and I get paid £10,000 for my 90 minute keynote speeches and you know, I've sold, I don't know if I've sold a million books yet, but it, it might not be far off that. Um, hey, look, I haven't sold for 20 million, like Rich Dad, Poor Dad, but I figure if I write 200 books, I might sell 20 million. Well, yeah, you might do. Yeah. I mean, as somebody who's just finished his first book. Congratulations. Uh, Waiting publishing. <laughs> Writing 12 just is uh, staggering, but, you know, maybe I'll catch it one day. So, you know, like you say, the book you're most known for is, is money. And in order to sit down and write a book about that, you've got to have some fairly... Uh, settled, uh, refined, distilled thinking about it. Yes. So what would you reckon, what do you say was the core message uh, of that book? Okay, so I would not have been able to write a book money, a, a book about money 11 years ago unless it was how to lose it and squander it. Um, <laughs> so I think you're right. Anyone who talks about a subject should know what they're talking about. And um, I would say um, money is a part of my experience going from a lot of debt to, you know, tens of millions. I'm not a billionaire yet, but, you know, like I'm, I'm on the way. Um, and I think, you know, if, if you've written a book about money, I think you should be a multimillionaire. And if you're not, what are you doing? And I think there are a lot of books out there on money for people who maybe haven't made so much. But there's also then the study, the research, the history, the psychology, the story, you know, over time, how money has changed form. So there's the research as well as the personal experience. And if I could say what I intended money to be, because it's 160,000 words, which is 100,000 words more than my publisher wanted. But (laughs) I I pushed back on them and I said, look, you can't write a book about money and have it a short 50,000 word book. There's nothing wrong with that for other concepts, but money is a massive subject. Uh, And so the concept of money is I wanted it to be a one stop shop. Uh, I'd read so many books on money, but there wasn't a a book that had it all. Some was the the history, some was the psychology, some was the mindset, some was some strategies, but there wasn't a book that had it all. And so I wanted money to be like the cyclopedia of money. I wanted it, of course, to be something of someone's real experience. And then I guess the main goal I have, Pete, with money is that in the UK especially, it's like there's a bit of a faux pas. It's socially wrong to say, hey, I love money and I want to make money. It's like, you know, it's like we're seen as evil capitalist uh, and there's nothing wrong with wanting to provide for your family and to have some nice material items. As long as you balance that with service and value to the community or the globe, if you can reach that far. So it's like embracing the selfish and the selfless. uh, The, you know, I want to live a good life, but I want to give a good life to others. And that's why I called it um, no more, make more, give more. Yeah, really important. Yeah, it's, it, it shouldn't be entirely self-centred, uh, otherwise it's an imbalance. So that was, uh, yeah, that's a great subtitle. And I think I also, Pete, sorry to jump in, if it is too selfish, over time society will overthrow you. And yeah, if you look absolutely. at people have been too greedy over time, society have forced them either into prison or assassinated, you know, thousands yeah. of years ago, or into philanthropy. Like Bill Gates was forced into philanthropy. It wasn't his plan in his 20s. He wanted to be a millionaire. But society literally said, look, you've made billions and billions. You need to start yeah. giving it some of it away, mate. Um, some of it, yeah. And, and, and I modelled people like Buffett, Gates, Vanderbilt, Carnegie, going all the way back. And I set up my, um, my philanthropic cause, my foundation last year. Um, because I thought, well, rather than waiting for society to force me and me go through some difficult PR and challenges why don't I start it early while I'm still young um, and for those critics that would have said oh Rob you're just writing a book about money so you can make more money um, so I, I give all of the profits of the book money to my foundation cool we'll make sure there's links obviously to all the, Thank you. the things that we, that we uh, talk about in the show notes so when uh, 
you reached out to me, Rob, and um, like I say, it's one of those things that you know I kind of I knew you were, mm. and then you know the email arrives. It's like okay, yeah, let's chat with Rob. <laughs> but we we were sort of back and forth. What should we talk about? You know what might add some value. And um, you mentioned these sort of twelve like essential money management rules and that sort of piqued my interest so let's yeah. sort of dive into those and uh, i've got them sort of in front of me and uh, i imagine you have too but if there was one rule if you could distill good financial management and behavior and all that sort of stuff into one sort of overarching rule what would that be yeah okay so there's one fundamental rule around managing money which is the most ridiculously simple thing that i'm going to say that anyone would ever say, such that it's almost embarrassing to say it, but I'm going to say it because um, you've asked me for one and I can give you lots. And that is never spend more than you earn. And it sounds so ridiculous, but with consumer credit, with the ease of getting credit, uh, you know, with a, 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 a modern world where we rack up debt and go and do what we want and we vagabond more and we travel more. Uh, you know, the old, old culture was you never spend it unless you've got it. Um, yeah. And that culture is, you know, a little bit outdated now. Uh, so a lot of people are earning 3000 and spending 3500 earning 10000 and spending 15000 mm -hmm. And wealth also means well-being. The history of the word wealth is well-being, uh, you know, in relation to money, not just money. Um, so if you spend more than you earn every month, you get yourself into more debt and then emotionally you feel guilt, resentment, you know, and all the, the negative emotions which compound um, that, that, that manifestation. So one needs to first off find out exactly where they are at. And I did a TV show for Channel 4. Um, it, it's a pilot, but it might become a big series um, if they commission it. Uh, and my job was as a money coach to um, basically help various couples in different degrees of debt in different life situations. Uh, and, and the process went like this. I request for them to give me all their financial information, credit cards, bills, receipts, you name it. Then we go into um, a room where I get them to tell me their story and I fact find. Then I go and do my own fact finding to see if that corrob uh, matches, you know, and, and corroborates, if you like. Then I give them a, a money management plan moving forward and then they sign a contract with me. So it's like a five step process. I think it's a great concept for a TV yeah. show. Uh, and you'd be amazed, Pete, that people think they're spending three grand a month and they're spending five and six. Yeah. They think they're spending two grand and they're spending four. And they're completely delusional about how much they're spending and where they're spending it. They don't realise that, you know, one cup of two cups of coffee a day at three quid, you know, yeah. is 21 pounds a week, which is what, 85, 90 quid a month, which is a thousand pound a year. Lunches could be two thousand pound a year. And these things just all build up. So step zero because I have six levels of wealth, which is, um, you know, you get out of debt, then you save, then you invest, then you speculate, then you diversify, then you insure. They're the six levels that I go through um, in the in the book. Um, but most people need to do step one, which is get out of debt. And to get out of debt, you need to know what debt you're in and where you are and what you're spending. Then, of course, you reduce the spending and or earn some extra income. And then what you do is you make sure you apportion the money into the correct buckets. Because what most people do is the, the money goes into their account uh, and then it all gets, gets gone with direct debits and spending and everything else. And they're left with less. And the book um, Richest Man in Babylon teaches you to pay yourself first. Yep. And so that would be the next thing, Pete. Most people are spending more than they earn and therefore paying everyone else first and themselves last. They're paying their mortgage company first. They're paying their um, direct debits, you know, their sky, their um, broadband, their um, water, their heating, their mm. gym. Their, all that is first. And then what's left is nothing or debt. <laughs> and that's what they get. Whereas people always say to me, well, Rob, I can't afford to, because if I pay myself first, there'll be nothing left. Um, but if you, you know, if you pour glass into water and it fills and you empty it, there's space and you can fill it again. So if you save 300 pounds a month and you're worried that you're now going to be 300 pound down, well, you've saved it. And then you've got 30 days to go and earn an extra 300 pound or reduce your savings by 300 pounds. Um, spending, sorry, yeah. reduce your spending exactly by 300 pounds. Yeah. So step one, know where you're at. Never spend more than you earn. Step two Make sure you're saving every month and, and not touching it. And I can talk about these different accounts if you want to. And you go from getting out of debt to saving, to investing, to speculating, to insuring, to diversifying. Now, a lot mm. of people speculate before they invest. And a speculation is buying into a company, you know, or taking a calculated risk or investing in crypto. That's not an investment. That's a speculation. That's high mm. risk. An investment is an ISA or, you know, or a rental yeah. property or, um, you know, a managed fund. And knowing the difference between those is, is key.
Yeah, really important. When you've been dealing with these uh, families in this in this program, did you uh, do you have a sort of a set methodology or a way of thinking which helps people get out of debt? Is there you know sort of do this first and then that and then that or what? Yeah, I, I suppose I do. Um, though you know when you've been not only changing your life and going from debt to making money, but also I've helped hundreds of thousands of people with my keynote speeches, books, live events. I've done um, nearly eight hundred live speaking events now. Um, you can just see it immediately. It, you know, it just becomes clear. Like, I guess anyone who's done yeah. something, you know, there are people smarter than me and doing it longer than me. You just have this sixth sense, I suppose. For me, the first step is where are they at? And I know that they're going to be delusional about where they're at. Otherwise, yeah. they wouldn't be in debt. Yeah, exactly. So I know that they're going to be spending more than they think. So step one is getting where they're at. Then step two is going through their delusions and picking them off. Step three is getting them to accept that they're not in the greatest position, but also that it's not their fault. It's not someone's fault and they shouldn't beat themselves up if they've not ever been taught how to manage money. Yeah, now, sure. get this, Pete, for a crazy thing. When I was at school, I was in some of the top set. So, you know, a lot of successful people flunked at school. I did all right at school. Um, mm -hmm. And because I was in the highest set in, in languages, they moved us to do geography in French. And they called it geography and they taught us geography, but you couldn't speak a word of English. You had to speak French for the whole year. Mm. How insane and crazy and ridiculous and surreal is it to learn geography in French? You know, I don't walk yeah. down Paris High Street talking geography to people, making money out of that. That doesn't benefit my livelihood in any way. But no. I wasn't taught about budgeting, money bucketing, saving, you know, managing my money emotions, my mindset around money. I was, and, and no schools teach that. And I'm no, not knocking I'm schools. I know a lot of people knock the schooling system. There's a lot of good things that the schooling system does. But we need better money management skills. Um, I always say you'll never make money or make more money until you learn to manage what you've already made. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and this that's, is why that's one of your 12 points. Isn't yes. It? This is why nearly all lottery winners go bust and winning a lottery for 99 percent of people is a curse, not a gift. Yeah. Because if yeah. you give an alcoholic a million quid, you know where that money's going. And that's not knocking. You just know if yeah. you give an, a gambler a million quid, if you gave a philanthropist a million quid, you know where that's going. If you give a capitalist a million quid, you know where that's going. If you gave yeah. a car enthusiast a million quid, you know where that's going. If you gave a party animal a million quid, you know where that's going. So it's, it's the fundamental education from the grassroots. And that's what my um, foundation, that's the vision of it, to help change the education system um, by teaching better money, money management fundamentals and economics, but not theoretical economics, like economics as in you're going to earn three grand uh, and um, here's how to get it up to five and ten grand. And here's how to manage all your expenses. And here's how to manage uh, keeping up with the Joneses and you're um, wanting to fill your voids of importance by spending money on doodads and you know here's how to be disciplined around money and here's how to get your happiness around other things than spending money and so on one of the things that you mentioned uh, in sort of preparation for this is uh, one of the things you suggest is not buying clothes gadgets or fripperies i think you call them for a year but instead only buy liabilities from passive income mm. so talk, talk to me about that because that's yeah. a hell of a thing but you do hear about that the sort of the no spend year or the you know the no gadget year or whatever so what's yeah. the thinking behind that well um this is a bit of a controversial one people i'm going to stick my flag in the ground a lot of people you know when i mentor them and i say look you've got to cut your spending right down oh well life's too short you can't take it with you you know oh, why <laughs> yeah. should i do that i've got a lifestyle to maintain not spending money on depreciable liabilities, clothes, holidays, um, other things, you know, i.e. where you, you erode capital and it goes down to zero. It's not just about not doing that. It's proving you've got the discipline to be able to manage your emotions around money better. Uh, and if people are skinned, they shouldn't be going on three holidays a year. They should not. Do it, do it in a cheap way. Go down to the coast here on the East Coast, wherever do a cheap holiday, go on like a camping trip with your, your family for a week, which will cost nothing. Because not only do you, you shouldn't do it because you haven't got the money, but when you go and you spend the money that you haven't got and you see your credit card bill in 30 days time, you're going to feel even worse. That's going to compound. You're going to beat yourself up and you'll create this um, vicious yeah. cycle if you like. So I think people who are struggling with money, they need to learn the discipline, the management of not spending money on things that don't increase in value. 
So, you know, pretty much anything can, in any class, can go up or down. I've got a Ferrari 458, and that's gone up nearly 30 grand. Hmm. Um, I've got, um, you know, Odomar's Piguet and Patek watches, which have gone up as much. So a car can be a depreciable liability, but it can be an appreciating asset. A watch can be a liability or an asset. It's the, the, the key thing is learning what appreciates and what depreciates. You know, if you go um, and buy, uh, even though I've made tens of millions of pounds, Pete, I'll still buy stuff on eBay secondhand. Um, so there was, there's this pair of Porsche design trainers. They're 350 quid. I saw them when I was out in Dubai. And I thought, you know, 350 quid is nothing to me. And I don't mean to sound flippant, but it's not. And I could have easily bought them. I thought, you know what? 350 quid for a pair of trainers? No chance. And I went on eBay and I found a pair for 110 quid. So I've <laughs> saved two thirds of that capital, which can go investing into something that goes up five or 10% a year for the rest of my life. So there's a cost of capital and there's a cost of appreciated capital over time. And then I can have those trainers for two years. And as long as I look after them, I could probably sell them at a 10 pound loss. So I've, that pair of trainers has cost me 10 quid over two or three years. Now, if you take that same mindset with everything you buy, I'll give you another example. I wanted an extra charger for my Mac and I went into the Apple store in Dubai, 80 quid for a charger. You know, and like I said, I've made enough money that 80 quid is nothing. No way am I buying a charger for 80 quid. Absolutely no way. Go on eBay, pay 20 quid for a second hand one. Now, I'm not saying you have to be a thrift all the time. And sometimes you can reward yourself. That's OK. But you've got to understand that everything you buy, um, does it depreciate or does it appreciate? So I have this rule. If I'm going to spend a decent amount of my capital, which should be preserved for assets, I want to make sure that I can hold that capital and preserve it in something, i.e. I buy something and it won't go down. And if I've got something that I'm going to buy that will go down, I'll most likely lease it and I'll get an asset that pays passive income that pays off the lease. So, okay. so you know, some, for example, the Ferrari I've, I've bought in cash, uh, the, the 458, um, because I figured that'd probably go up. And it has, yeah. it's, you know, like paid 165, it's probably worth nearly 200 now. But I just bought a Panamera Turbo S and they're um, about 175 grand new. And I got a, a, sec a used one, um, which is only five months old, but it had gone down 35. And I got a lease on that. Uh, yeah, um, that ain't going up in value. No, no, it won't. Now, there's not that many of them, though. There's only two on the market. So the, the prices are strong. But yeah, time will tell you a car like that will go down. Yeah. Um, but, but the car market's strong at the moment. But um, if, that, that, if, I, sorry, if I put 30 odd grand down on that and I've got about 2,000 pound on finance... Um, if I can find a commercial building that I can buy and rent out and I can make three grand a month, the two grand pays for the car. I've got a grand left. And then every month the car is paid for and I still own the asset and the asset's going up in value. Mm. Yeah. Oh, it makes perfect sense, doesn't it? It's um, I mean, obviously you're using big numbers there, but it can that be applied on a much smaller basis? Yeah. You know, so if somebody's buying like a. I don't know, Ford car or something, yep. or, you know, um, it's a Toyota Aigo, they do the same thing. So, yeah. you know, so you're on about buying liabilities from passive income. So putting your money to better work elsewhere yep. to produce an income, which then you can spend on stuff, right? Yeah, uh, it can work. The, 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 the fundamental is the behavior and it works whether you make a pound or a million pounds passive income. So, yeah. you know, there are a lot of half decent cars now. You can get between 80 and 110 quid on the lease. So you're right to not talk about my number so much. Forget those. Unless there's a car you like, it's between 80 and 120 quid on the lease. And if, if you look on decent leasing websites, lease deals on cars are quite cheap now. And every now and again, they chuck out a crazy deal. So um, when we got my wife, her Audi RS6, which was what about there, about 81 grand new, um, we got a deal on that on contract hire and leasing for £595 a month, which is nothing for a car like that. And that is one HMO's multiple let uh, income. Um, so one multi-letted house pays for that. Let's use the smaller numbers. Let's say you want a Toyota Igo or whatever, a smart car. It's £80 a month. You, you, um, you go to a friend or a family member. Um, you raise a deposit, you buy a buy-to-let, or you take a chunk of capital and you buy a buy-to-let and you're putting it into an asset, then the net passive income pays for the lease on the car and the car is free and you still own the asset and the capital is preserved. Very cool. So passive income, is it just properties or are there other sources? Um, I think that there are multiple sources of passive income. I think you just have to be clear on the definition of passive income. Now, yeah. some people tout passive income as, hey, you know, you can buy this thing and overnight you can sleep and make millions. Uh, and I don't believe passive income is like that. I think you have to work hard enough not to have to work hard. And I think you have to set to forget. But 
Um, Slade wrote A Christmas Number One, and I bet everyone's now singing it in their mind. Now, they wrote that in the 70s, and they've been earning £500,000 a year ever since, 40-odd years later. So that's proof that residual passive income from assets, an asset can be IP, a song, royalties. Um, It it can be, you know, um, Michael Jackson bought a lot of the Beatles back catalogue. Um, do, you, do you remember Vanilla Ice's fav, uh, famous yeah. song? Well, he got taken to court by the original writers of that little riff, which yeah. I think was from Under Pressure, which was playing, Queen yeah. and someone else. And he, uh, he, he played a smart play here. So he was going to court with them because um, they were suing him. Now, by the way, in those days, everyone was doing loops and, and, and ripping yeah. off music. But no one was bothered about it because he made, he sold, I think, 120 million of that song. It was crazy. So they went after him. And he said, look, I'll tell you what, I'll settle out of court and I'll pay some money. But I want the rights to that song as well. And he bought the rights to that song. And he's been earning tens of millions off the rights of that song. So he, because he did that as part of the deal. And so it's really a thought process, Pete, about um, how can you buy an asset that pays recurring income? Um, how do you set up an asset? What is the asset? Um, some assets like property will pay a residual income through rental. Other assets are just a capital preserve, like, for example, precious metals. If you put money into gold, it doesn't pay your yeah. passive income. If you buy art, classic cars, watches, which if you buy the right ones, they're appreciating a lot, but they don't pay residual income. Um, but a business can pay residual income if you're not working in it all day, every day. Yeah. A license, some IP, um, you know, something that you rent out and it doesn't just have to be a property uh, can all pay residual passive income. Oh, good. Lots of ideas there. Yeah. Lots of stuff for, for uh, people to, to grab hold of. Now, one of your sort of uh, 12 essentials for money management is to save a target percentage of your income and increase it over time. I love mm. this one. This is one of my favorites. I bang on about this all the time. So let's just explain your thinking with that. OK, so. To never spend more than you earn means you need to be at 99% spending versus earning. So you've got to target a date when you're spending less than 100% of what you earn. Um, And if someone's in debt, uh, just to get to saving 1%, that's actually should be celebrated. It's a big thing because you've reversed the tide. Once you've done that, then you want to try and push it up to 5%. So let's say you earn, you know, let's make the numbers easy. You earn a thousand pound a month. Well, you know, 5% of that is 50 quid. Um, and then um, the more you save, uh, the, the more that you build up. And um, if you can push your earnings, because a lot of people when they talk about budgeting, only talking about reducing spend. But if you doubled your income, then you, you, could, you could go from 95% to 45% overnight if you doubled your income. Um, and people don't often think about that, you know, go and get a part time job, go and sell a load of stuff on on eBay. There's so many things that you can do to bring in some income. Uh, and and, and I, I found that once I was at sort of 80 percent spend to earn, it was more comfortable. And then when you get under 50 percent spend to earn, you know, you've got a good lifestyle. And then you target such that no matter how much you spend, you don't even touch the sides of what you earn. Um, And I make a rule that I never spend more than I earn unless I am putting capital into an investment. Yeah. Yeah, because that's not spending then, is no, it? No, it's, it's investing. Yeah, 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 converting sort of cash or whatever yeah. into something which is going to appreciate. Mm. Cool. I, one of the one of your things that uh, it's almost raised an eyebrow because it, it seems almost um, it seems very conventional, which is to max out your ISA. Mm. <laughs> I agree, yeah. by the way. But I thought oh, I would, uh, sort of expected you to be far more controversial than that somehow. But you're dead right. So mm. I wasn't thinking that. Well, um, yeah. Sometimes there's some controversial things, but sometimes people miss <laughs> the fundamentals. Like there are some ISA millionaires now, who, people who've yeah. been putting the maximum amount in their ISA since it started and reinvesting the dividends and not drawing on it and saving it uh, because obviously the point of the ISA is to incentivize you to keep the money in the system for a long time and you get a bit of a tax break on that when you draw it uh, and all the uh, dividends that you get is reinvested and it's tax free. So um, you should target to invest a maximum amount every year because the compounded effect of tax is huge. Um, and I'm not I'm not one for not paying any tax, just so you know. I'm one for paying you're, you're fair. <laughs> no, but even then, it's a bit of a myth though about Amazon don't pay it tax. Is. I know, I know. That was too flippant. Yeah, yeah. Um, don't make a lot of profit. But way. exactly. Yeah. And, and the national insurance employers, employees, VAT, you know, there's a, there's a hell of a load of tax generated. I think it's totally within an entrepreneur's right to reduce their personal income tax with the legitimate strategies you could find on the HMR website if you cared to look. 
Yeah. And there's a big difference between that and evasion. And, the, you know, like... I spent a lot of time with the former and uh, helping people avoid the latter. Yeah, ex exactly. And I think a lot of people just perceive, oh, you're not paying tax, therefore you're evading. No. You know, the HMRC, it, like, they're, they're painted in a bad light often. The reality is they want to and they have incentivized creators, innovators and entrepreneurs. The world must incentivize those people to take the risk, to have no recurring secure income. Because otherwise, why would we? We have to be rewarded exponen exponentially for that risk. Um, mm -hmm. And as such, capital allowances and various expenses that you can offset. There's so many different things you can offset as a, an entrepreneur, as an employer. And we're incentivized to do that. And, and, and I actually ap applaud the HMRC for that. Now, they don't go banging it down your throat because, you know, the, mm -hmm. you know if you don't claim everything, then they, they have a bit more money. Um, yeah. And that's up to you, the entrepreneur, to find those uh, you know, le legitimate rules, if you like. But it is just so simple to max out your ISA every year. Uh, and then when I got married, I started filling my wife's ISA. And then when I had my kids, I started filling theirs. Yeah. Um, just because, you know, that that's money that you... I, I call that save and never touch money. So, Sant. Um, okay. you know, when I put money in the ISA, the goal is to never touch it ever again. And people are like, well, why would you put money somewhere <laughs> and never touch it? The point is, I want the capital to grow so much that you can live off the income. Okay. Um, and, you know, there's going to be one day where I might switch that reinvesting dividend into drawing that dividend. Um, and the, the, the big, the, you know, capital attracts income. Uh, and, and, you know, statistically and on average, you could probably expect 5% return on capital, depending on where you've invested it. Yep. Um, so the larger you build your capital, the more that 5% income is. And if you've got a million quid, it's 50 grand a year. And if you've got 10 million quid, it's 500 grand a year. Now, of course, there is tax and everything else. Um, so you want to build your capital reserves and preserve capital at all cost. Now, there's plenty of listeners, Pete, who've earned a lot of money in their life, but they haven't preserved capital. They've eroded it by spending it on holidays, you know, on having fun, on depreciable material items and eroded their capital. Whereas if they preserved it and then invested it and grew that capital, they'd be very wealthy by now. Mm, all true. There's a couple of these which I've left till uh, the end because... Uh... Well, because I decided to, and uh, one of them particularly is a topic of much interest to me. But one of the ones he says is it's essential when managing money that you take some calculated risks, but yep. that have the downside covered. So I wonder what you mean by that. Yeah. So the reason I have those six levels, getting out of debt, saving, investing and then speculating is that when you start and you haven't got much experience in investing, you should not take big risks. That's bad advice. You know, and, and like my most famous quote is, if you don't risk anything, you risk everything. And of course, there's Richard Branson and all these entrepreneurs who look like they take big risks. But when you study them closely, they take risks and have some downside covered. So when Virgin um, was set up and Richard Branson got in the airlines, he had a, um, a deal, an option type deal where he could get, give the plane back. And he wasn't left with this, you know, yeah. ridiculous liability that he couldn't do anything with and he'd lose all his money. So a calculated risk is investing in something that is you know, relatively safe. Now, the safer it is, the, le the, le the lower return you'll get. And the more risky it is, the higher return you could get. But protecting the downside. And I'll give you an example. If you, um, if I was to lend you money, Pete, and we were going to go into a property venture together, I, I lent you money, you went and find, found a nice property to manage. We, we shared it 50-50. You do the work, I put the money in. If I just gave you the money, I'm not protecting the downside risk. I know you wouldn't. You're, you know, a good man. But, you, you know, oh. I'm risking you going and, you know, getting rid of that yeah. money somehow. Yeah. Whereas if I, I put a... Trump, I'm off. Yeah, exactly. Whereas if I put a first charge on the property, even if the deal goes wrong, I have call on that property. So that is taking a calculated risk, you know, put, put investing my money with you, but protecting the downside by having a charge on the property. And that, you know, so like, but, you know, business is about balancing risk. And what that is, is seeing upside, but not doing anything flippant. You know, so you go into a venture, but you have an agreement and that agreement has some clauses in there which maybe protect you. Um, you know, you're giving of information, but you protect some of your IP with copyright. You know, that would be protecting the downside. Yeah, OK, makes sense. Yeah, it all, all makes sense. Now, behaviour is everything. Uh, in my book, you know, yeah. we most of us can learn some basic money management sort of techniques, the things we need to do. Most people just need to use their ISAs and pensions. And as you say, 
uh, first of all, spend less than they earn. But emotions can really knacker that up, can't they? Yeah. So well, that's I know that's this is the last one of your um, sort of money management rules that I wanted to address, uh, which you put as extreme emotions, both good and bad, erode wealth. Yeah. So we should manage money logically. Easier said than done, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. I mean, if we think about anything we've done in our life that we've regretted deeply, we've probably been very emotional, either very angry very guilty, very frustrated, very depressed, and sometimes elated, um, you know, or we've been in a peak emotional state. Uh, and um, wisdom and long-term sustainable wealth, because I'm interested in that, Pete. Um, yeah. I'd, I'd um, forego a little bit of quick income if it means I could make more in the long term. Um, so I'm more, I'm more interested in enduring and long-term success around wealth. So I'll give you some examples. If you are overly elated, you may go out and celebrate and you might buy everyone in the bar a round of drinks and champagne's flowing and you have this massive party and you hire a private jet and woo, you know, and, and, but, you know, the, the reward didn't warrant it. Conversely, you might be so depressed that you go and buy a load of things to try and cheer yourself up. So either, either one of those extremes can be as damaging as each other. Uh, and, and I have had spending, I'd, I'd call, nearly call them addictions, Pete, where yeah, I'd get my yeah. pay packet every week and I'd have to go and buy designer clothes to make myself look good and feel good. And if I was out, I'd always have to get the round in. I was one of those friends you'd want to be out in a drink with. But that's just so, you know, and I'd put it on a credit card and I'd spend money I couldn't afford. Um, yeah. So when you balance your emotions, for example, by all means, go out and shop, um, but buy something that you can take back or um, wait and go and do price research afterwards. If you're making any business or investment decisions, do your research, um, get yourself out of overly elated or overly depressed as the as sort of the basic extreme, and then make your decision when you are emotionally neutral, you know, when you're balanced, which means you shouldn't make important investment decisions when you're really tired or when you're really wired. Um, <laughs> because, you know, like people just perceive that the downside emotions are damaging. But I've made some of my bad decisions because I've got too excited and I haven't done enough research and I haven't had enough of a sceptical view. If someone came up to you and pitched you a good idea and they wanted a million quid and you got really excited and they got really excited and you just gave them a million quid, you know, you didn't have a contract and an agreement and do research, that would be totally dumb. Mm -hmm. But on a very small level, but many more times, people are managing their money that way. That's genius. Don't make decisions when you're either wired or tired. Yeah. <laughs> That's the click to tweet quote, <laughs> yeah. I think, from, <laughs> from this week. Um, you know, all, everything you've said today, Rob, makes perfect sense. Of course it does. I mean, so much of it resonates with what I bang on about here on the show every week and what my book, uh, you know, includes. Mm. Really, there's nothing new under the sun when it comes to managing ourselves and managing our money. Mm. Um, but sometimes it takes a while, right? Yeah. You know, although you were obviously a very wealthy man by the time you were in your early 30s, it still took a little while. It didn't happen overnight. Did you ever sort of wonder whether you were going to make it or not? Are you one of these sort of <laughs> permanently, um, uh, you know, uh, God, what's the word? Um, oh, gosh, are you one of the people who are permanently positive and, you know, it's always, always going to be fine? Did you ever struggle with motivation? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not one of these always positive people. I'd say I'm overall glass half full because that, you know, I, I, yeah. but I have been overall glass half empty and I've had periods in my life. Um, and you could say, well, Rob, you know, you, you got into money and property and business probably when you were 26, 27, and you became a millionaire before 31. That's a short amount of time. But actually, it took me my whole life to get there, didn't it? It's yeah. just, you know, so don't measure me on those few short years because everything was preparation for that. Uh, and of course, you know, the 10 years to be an overnight success, which is quite famous. You know, you see the Susan <laughs> Boyle opening her mouth and you think, wow, you don't realize the hard graft she's done, the comedians who've done all of the, yeah. you know, the dingy clubs and things like that. So I would say my whole life was a preparation. And then when I really went for it and, and took everything I'd learned, then it happened quicker. Um, I think there's a few things that will help us along this journey, Pete. And um, someone, one of my mentors said to me um, something along the lines, and I might be butchering their quote, but they said, most people overestimate what they can achieve in a year, but underestimate what they can achieve in a lifetime. Mm -hmm. or, or, you know, or, or overestimate what they can achieve in a short time and underestimate what they can achieve in a, in, in a long time. So basically, um, don't expect things to happen today, tomorrow, next week, next month. But if you consistently 
uh, maintain these habits, these emotions, these behaviours. You keep reading and learning. You listen to podcasts. You read books. You get mentors. You go on courses. You know, you do online learning. You hang around smart people that you can learn from and take, um, you know, people with good business experience out for dinner when you can and try and find out what they know. The compounding result of that is huge. And the thing that illustrates that the most, and if I could get someone to imagine this, because most people have probably seen this meme going around on social media, but there's this really cool visual which looks like a graph where you've got money along the left and you've got time along the bottom. I forget which one's the X and Y axis. Yeah, um, but, I always do too. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you know the one where Warren Buffett's wealth over time and he starts when he's what, in his teens? Mm -hmm. And by the age of 50, the, the graph's hardly moved. And then by the yeah. age of 88, it's, it's gone right up. Um, like the, the, the side of a mountain. Um, but actually, if you look really closely at it, from naught to 50, you might have made 50 million. But then from 50 to 88, you might have made 60 billion. So, <laughs> so the point is, compounding it as, I think it was, was it Einstein that said compounding is the eighth yep. wonder of the world? Yeah. Um, and, and so, um, don't be hard on yourself. Don't beat yourself up. Don't expect results overnight. Just try and learn something every day. Um, you know, like I write a lot and, you know, my, people say, wow, Rob, you've written 12 books in seven years. You know, that's a huge thing. But I don't write 12 books in seven years. I write words in a day. And sometimes I'll sit there looking at the paper and I'll write no words in a day. And I'll beat myself up all week about being a rubbish writer. And then other days the coffee's hit me good and I can chuck out 12,000 words. Yeah. And, you know, some days I write a chapter or two. And I think what I've got better at, because I used to beat myself up a lot. I never had a lot of self-worth. And now, instead of catching myself doing stuff wrong all the time, um, which I, I, I like, I had a bit of an argument with my kids this morning, um, Pete, and I wasn't, I, I lost my, the, my, the plot a bit. And I felt guilty all day. But, you know, like, yeah. that doesn't happen very often. And instead of beating myself up all day about that, I say, you know what, Rob, you've done a good thing. You're putting your kids through private school. You know, you've, you take Bobby around the world for his golf. You've raised one of the best seven-year-old golfers in the world. Um, you know, you've got a balanced, happy family. You've got a, a feisty, fiery, cheeky little daughter. And I, I've tried yeah. to teach myself to pick up the positives of the things I've done. So yeah, definitely. every day do something. Don't put an expectation on it because spending and saving and investing work the same. Try and forgive yourself for the mistakes you make and catch yourself out doing things well. And over time, as long as you keep going and don't, you know, get the shiny penny syndrome, in a year or three or five, you'll, you'll, you'll probably surprise yourself on how well you can do and how much money you can make because it does work and it does happen. It does. Rob, I don't mind admitting that when you first reached out, I sort of, I know, like I said, I kind of knew who you were. I thought, oh, is this going to be a good fit for me and for money? You know, is this, this is going to be, it's all about property, it's all about property, all that mm. sort of stuff. But obviously then I did a bit of homework, <laughs> you know, and sort of listened to your podcast a bit more and all Thank that you. sort of stuff. And I'm really glad to have had you on, actually. This has been... This has been a lot of fun and it's been a lot of value here. Where can people uh, find out more about who you are and what on earth you're doing? OK, thank you, Pete. So if you search Rob More Progressive on any of the social media like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, etc., you'll find me there. Um, and I suppose we've talked a lot about money. So my book, Money, if you search Amazon and Audible, you'll find it. Or my podcast, Money, if you search anywhere you find podcasts on iTunes or Stitcher. Um, and, yeah. then, and then you'll probably find other stuff I've done from that. Um, it's really kind what you've said, Pete, and um, it'd be nice if we could get in touch after this and it'd be lovely to have you on My Money Show in return if you wouldn't um, mind doing yeah, that. Yeah, I would love to. Yeah, I really appreciate that. This has been a lot of fun, man, and uh, I'm sure we'll be uh, keeping in touch from now on. Rob Moore, thank you so much for joining me here on Meaningful Money. Thank you. Thanks, Pete. And we're clear. Thank you, mate. Really enjoyed it. All right. That. That was ace. Brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> it's like you've done it before. <laughs> Likewise. <laughs> how, how many episodes have you done now? Uh, almost exactly the same as you on the uh, disruptive entrepreneur. This wow. will be, uh, I think, something sort of like 257 or 8. Episode oh, 258. Yeah, six, six it's, it's mostly weekly, but I'm now, uh, well, I'm now putting out just a, bit, a short one on a Friday. This one will be, I've switched to a seasons format a few, ah, a few years yeah. ago. Yeah. So I tend to, I'll deal with the subject in depth over sort of eight to 10 weeks, but then I'll just drop one in because this obviously won't necessarily logically fit into a season. So I'll just yeah. drop it in next week. And oh, it's okay. like a bonus then. Great. And um, um, I've always been intrigued. How does the season thing work? Because the, the scary thing about doing seasons for me is that void where they don't know you and they may sort of fall off. Um, and each time Apple do an update, you have to bloody resubscribe to all your podcasts again. 
Um, all right. Well, no, it's still it's still just one stream. Uh, so it's it literally it's just right. Okay, it's still a weekly podcast. So yeah. I just think right. What do I want to deal with in depth? Right. And sort of map it out, write it, and uh, I, I still don't, I don't batch record. No. I still only I usually record about three days before it goes out. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I just think right. I'm going to deal with this for the next ten weeks. Yeah. And right. People really get into it. The uh, response and the engagement from it has has been much better than I ever did by being sort of fairly random with what I dealt with. So but you have like themes, I, is that? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. That's all they are. So yeah. I've, I've just started one, I'm two episodes into 10 on basically personal finance first principles. So right. the real sort of, not not the basics, but the fundamentals, if you like. So last week's was, def- this week's, defining wealth. What does it mean to be wealthy? Mm. And then I'm going to go deep into, you know, inflation, why it's both a blessing and a curse. And yeah. All that sort of stuff, depending on what stage of life you're at. Um, so just going deep into it, and people absolutely bloody love it. So I'm yeah. so like the first season, if you like, was 163 episodes because that was just starting. Yeah. And then they've been sort of eight to ten uh, since then. So wow. Um, yeah, it mm. just works well, but it, it's just a slightly different format, really. But it's still, if you search "meaningful money" on iTunes, it's still just you know, it's still just 250 odd episodes on there. Yeah. Oh, so it doesn't right. look like seasons on there. I haven't. Some people do. Some people yeah, they do. do. They take like a, a season off. Yeah. Yeah, and sometimes people release them as like a standalone podcast. So you've mm. got a new RSS feed you submit to iTunes, all that sort of stuff. I think, well, I'm not sure what the point of that is really. Yeah. Because like you say, you might somebody might subscribe to one and then not find the other ones mm. necessarily. So yeah, whatever. It's just it seems to work for me. But it's time to do more video again, and uh, but still running my business down here. So yeah. I'm. Um, making uh, sort of positive steps to try and make myself redundant here uh, over the next uh, two, three years so that I can do a lot of the stuff that I really love doing full time. So, right. so I'm, uh, yeah, very much uh, a long way behind you, mate. But um, Well, I uh, let you, you're doing great work. And, you know, obviously I reached out to you because of how well your podcast has done. So that's how I found you. Yeah, so. it's 60,000 60, downloads a month, something like that. Wow. So it's, yeah, well done. It's, it's, it's it's been life changing for me. Yeah, you know, uh, in terms of the reach, the number of clients is brought into my mm. brick and mortar practice here. So yeah, it's pretty cool. And I, you know, being approached to write a book and all that sort of stuff, it's all uh, things that I've always dreamed about doing and wanted to do. And it's it's been the mechanism to uh, sort of springboard those things. So yeah, pretty cool. Thank Amen. You so much for reaching out, Rob. All right, cheers, Pete. Take care. Yeah, I'll keep you in touch. All right. Okay. And I'll, uh, I'll probably go out next Monday. That's the plan. Okay. Excellent. Thank all you. Right. Cheers. Thank-